Good morning, everybody. Um, after that long list of introductions from each of you, it truly is a pleasure to be here. I'm usually talking to groups that I don't know as well as I now know each and every one of you. My bio is in the binder, but a little bit of context as to who I am. My name is Scott Shanker. I'm the general manager for events and the Microsoft production studio at Microsoft. Anyone here heard of Microsoft? It's usually the answer I get. Anyone here not have a relationship with Microsoft? That's also the reaction I get. There's not a single hand in the room. And that's both marvelous and very unique for us as an organization. Between our various product sets ranging from Xbox through Azure Cloud Services, we typically have a relationship with almost everybody in the business world and more and more everybody on the non-business side of things as well. So as you can imagine, our events portfolio is incredibly diverse. Um, we just came off of 60 days between March and early May with three major shows, external shows alone that were our hosted events, uh, Microsoft Convergence, Microsoft Build, Microsoft Ignite. We had 40,000 total. We had over a half million online for the keynote webcasts alone. And that's just three of the roughly 7,000 plus events a year that we do as an organization. I'm not responsible for all of those by any means. As a company, as diverse as we are, we have multiple groups that handle different communities, different audiences, different um, activities, et cetera. The other part of my life is I'm the founder and a writer for a blog called Janus Dialogues. And that's where I look at what is emerging technically, socially, politically, and economically, and what impact that might have on the marketing and the experience in the events industry. Now, Microsoft's not in the events business. We use events very heavily to drive our business. And I, in my own background, have spent time on the agency side as well as on the enterprise side. So that's the background that I sort of bring to the conversation today. Isaac Asimov said, the only constant is change. But it actually goes on to say, continuing change, inevitable change, that is the dominant factor in society today. And that's still true today. Making plans is not about just knowing what's happening, it's knowing what is even longer out, even further out, even more uh, at the fringes, if you will, in order to plan for what the future looks like. If you're not changing, you are changing by de facto. You are falling behind, if you will, to the other things that are taking place around your world. So where do we look for change? And how do we know that it's coming? We look for change at the fringe. And when Sam asked me to present, uh, he said, I want you to knock them back on their heels a little bit. So over the next 40, 45 minutes, if I don't make you uncomfortable, I haven't done my job. The fringe is where things come from. They're, whether that's style, whether that's unusual ideas, whether that's black swans, the fringe is typically where things start. Things don't sort of come up or come across or come about wholly baked, wholly finished, whether that's technology, whether it's new cultural ideas, things don't just come out full formed. They come from the fringe. They start on the edges. And so that's where you need to be looking to get a sense for what may become the new norms in your world and in your future. Now, when a fringe becomes a new norm, I refer to it as a Janus moment. Janus is the god of transformation. It's the two-faced god that looks both forward and backwards. And it's at that moment that a fringe becomes a new norm that a Janus moment has occurred. Now, I sometimes introduce myself as the head of chaos and janitorial services. And I used to say that for the laugh factor. Thank you, Sam. Um, but over time, I found that the word janitor actually comes from the god Janus. Janitors were the caretakers of the places in which the god Janus, the realms of the god Janus, whether those were bridges or gateways or uh, entryways, places in which transformation took place. So it turned out that I was foreshadowing a little bit. And all of us as the caretakers of our events really are the janitors, the caretakers of where that event is going and the future that it will have. Change can happen quickly, change can happen very slowly. This is just a chart, um, and you'll notice on, the, on many of these slides there's a QR code, so I encourage you to snap that if you want. That'll take you to the actual URL or to the web page for whatever it is I'm referring to. 
Uh, but this is a chart that came out of, I think it was Bloomberg magazine, uh, showing the pace of change, social change. This is just social change. You can imagine a similar chart for technical change or political change or economic change. But this is just social change. And you can see that not only do some changes take an awfully long time, but some changes, at least nowadays, are happening in very short periods of time. My marriage would be illegal prior to 1967. Roe versus Way came about very quickly. Legalization of marijuana, very quickly. Sorry, same-sex marriage, very quickly. Legalization of marijuana in four states, very quickly. So the pace of social change is incredibly fast now. If you're doing an annual event, you can assume that the culture you're produ producing that event in will change tremendously over 12 months. And again, you can extra extrapolate this to the pace of change socially, economically, politically, and technically. So Janus Dialogues is where I bring some of these thinkings uh, into writing and into place. This was really a site that I started for two reasons. I was asked to make a presentation on trends in the events industry, and one of the trends that I saw was the growth of user-generated content. And I wanted to sort of prove the point that uh, user-generated content was changing the world. Janus Dialogues f enjoys the same distribution power as the BBC, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal. Not because there's anything special about it, but because that's what's changed in the world of user-generated content. It used to be that the distribution systems controlled much of the message and much of the content. And yet nowadays, because of the equality that the internet has afforded and the equality that media creation and capture has afforded, anyone can be a media outlet of essential, essentially equal distribution to even the most stalwarts of media houses. So I enjoy the same distribution power. That's not to say I have the same readership by any means but I enjoy the same distribution power of some of the largest organizations. So that's one trend that I saw early uh, having an impact on our businesses. Any organization, any association, any event owner who believes that they control content is now competing with a much larger universe of content creators and content distributors than they did before. One of the other new norms that Janus Dialogues kicked off with was equality. This continues today as equality, not only in social sense, but in economic sense and in political sense, continues to expand. Life logging is an interesting one. Uh, more and more we hear about uh, body cameras for police officers. That's just one aspect of life logging. But we also have people, how many people here have an activity tracker on their wrist? Yeah, you're all life logging. You're logging your lives. It may just be the activities that you take. It may be other things. There are bloggers. There are serial life loggers who literally capture every moment of their lives and share it in real time. And that's an interesting trend when it comes to the content you're presenting at your events and whether somebody has either the right or the expectation that they can log that and share it as part of their lives with everybody or anyone. <coughs> Protest. When Janus Dialogues was first born, protest was um, just uh, was was literally on the cover of Time magazine as Occupy Wall Street was the person of the year that year. And as you continue to see in the news, protest is no less a top a trend and topic today than it has been in the past. Protests from the Arab Spring to Occupy Wall Street to what's happened in Baltimore and other locations. How many of you have ever had an event, this is just a show of hands, we have some other questions later. How many of you have had an event that was completely disrupted by protest and had a stop? Yeah, there's about half a dozen hands. Overall, the events industry has actually been relatively spared from the kind of disruptive protests that we could be. Uh, pick your topic, pick your issue, whether it's the keynoter you have, the industry you represent, the business that you're in, et cetera. Protest is more and more becoming socially acceptable again. It is the normal way of responding to, an eth to a, a disruption or to a disappointment or to a position that a group of people might have. There's some new norms emerging that I'm not going to talk too much about today. Um, digitizing everything. 
I've been a photographer for much of my life. I now have about 30,000 images. They're all digitized. When I first started shooting, everything was on film. I had libraries, I had flat files, I had rooms controlled with temperature so that those films could be uh, well archived and well taken care of, and now it's digitized. So not only have we digitized everything media that we can think of, but we're now starting to digitize other things. We're digitizing driving. It is not unexpected that in the next five to 10 years, we will have self-driving vehicles. And maybe not on every single highway, but certainly in certain areas, in certain parts, eventually cities will say to get into the downtown area, you have to have a self-driving vehicle, has to plug into our system. When you get into the downtown congested areas, your car will take over. We're digitizing identification. More and more now, it's biometrics, it's eye scan, it's fingerprint scan, it's other ways of digitizing, it's your voice. We're digitizing your identity. We're certainly digitizing things like robotics. So digitizing everything, and I mean that. Think about anything, all of you have in your head something that says, yeah, no, he doesn't mean this. I mean that. Whatever it is you're thinking of that won't get digitized will get digitized. And if it gets digitized, it can be shared incredibly easily. It can be stolen. It can be copied. It can be altered. It can be hacked. It can be celebrated. So everything is getting digitized. This is a macro trend that you'll see more and more and more and more of in your worlds. Um, the shared economy is a second new norm that, again, I think at this point has sort of tipped its way already into our universe. How many folks are regular Airbnb users? U Uber? Lyft? Yeah, it's interesting. Uber and Lyft, all hands go up. Airbnb, less or so. From an events perspective, more and more we're seeing that our housing blocks are one part. How much Airbnb inventory is there in the city is a second part of our question as to whether we can actually do an event in that city. The shared economy is interesting. There was an article just yesterday about whether it's really a shared economy or whether it's just a new intermediary, a new um, operating model where the economics are changed and a different group of people are making the profits or whether it's really a shared economy as in five people get together, buy a car and share the car. Uber is not a shared economy. You don't share that car, you don't own that car. It's a disruption to the taxi distribution system. But the shared economy is one that continues. Again, that's because we've digitized information, we've made it easier for those connections to take place. One we were talking about just this morning and I think this will be very disruptive in the next few years, and that's the water shortage. We were talking over breakfast about how expensive internet access can be at hotels. In the next few years, internet access won't be the issue. You'll have a surcharge for water. What's that gonna do to your food and beverage budgets, or even, you know, or, or any other aspect when the water becomes the premium socially that's incredibly disruptive? Uh, and, and every one of the things I'm talking about is social, economic, political, and technical, not one of the four areas. But water shortages are already changing the way that the world works in California and in other places around the world. And then robotics, which is sort of a combination of digitizing everything and, uh, and, and more physical, tangible things. Uh, but the, ro the robotics and the artificial intelligence uh, we're already seeing some of the world's greatest uh, leaders and thinkers writing cautionary books about how some of the science fiction of Hollywood could actually come to play if we leave too much of our uh, future into the hands of artificial intelligence. So my hope with all of these is to simply give you a little bit of context that says it's happening everywhere. Everything at the fringe of social, political, economical, technical advancement has the potential of becoming a new norm. And I'm not advocating what you do about it. I'm simply saying, make sure you take the time regularly to look and say, what is it that's out there that is so unbelievable that I'm gonna dismiss it, but may well become something that I have to deal with in six months or 12 months or six years or 10 years, et cetera. Because often these trends are unstoppable. They may not last forever. They may not all make it into fruition, Video conferencing was created in the mid-1900s. It took until almost the, 20th, uh, almost the 2000s, 21st century for people to be comfortable using that technology every single day. Anyone here on Skype? Yeah, 
and comfortable with video broadcasting and video conferencing now? Very much so. And yet in the 60s, 70s, 80s, even early 90s, when the technology existed, though not as streamlined or as pretty as it is today, people weren't socially ready for it yet. So take the time. We at Microsoft started a series of trends and innovations. We take time every quarter to sit down and say, what is it that's coming? What is it we should be looking at? What is it we should be thinking about? So I would only encourage you, if you take only one thing away from the 45 minutes this morning, give yourselves time to regularly look at what's at the fringe and give yourselves just the moment to say, what could that mean to the, either the environment I'm in or to the leadership that I can bring to my events, to my industry, to my society? So let's talk about some, I think, big ones. Big in the sense that I'm trying to knock you on your heels, not that I think they're necessarily anything more than that. Let's talk about marijuana. Uh, marijuana had a Janus moment in 2012 where the majority of people said marijuana should be legal, surpassing the percentage who said it shouldn't be. That's a Janus moment where that crisscross takes place, where the majority says, yes, where a new norm takes place, where more people are using a product or a technology, that is a Janus moment. In 2012, marijuana in the United States had a Janus moment, and the majority of people felt that it should be legalized rather than not. Almost 75% of people polled right now feel that it's inevitable that marijuana will be federally legalized in the next few years. Okay, that's great. For most of us, that doesn't mean much. But does it or could it? When we see folks like Miley, Miley, Miley Cyrus, excuse me, not big on pop culture, somebody had to tell me who that was, um, lighting up on stage during the celebration, what message does that give and what does that say to folks that are 10 years old now and in 10 years will be attending our events? Is this a way to reach millenniums? I know the survey said that reaching millenniums is a part of what many of you are trying to accomplish. Is marijuana a way of reaching that millennium, of being viewed as hip, as being viewed as part of what's happening culturally today? With marijuana legal, it is no more or less problematic if you will, than wine or beer or a mixed drink. So here's my first question for all of you. Would you add to your event a marijuana tasting bar, similar to a wine tasting bar? So please take a moment and let's see what you all think. And then whenever you guys are ready, I guess the results go up. Okay, so I'm gonna keep going. We'll come back to the results in a minute here. I'll have another question for you in a second. So if marijuana wasn't, um, socially uncomfortable enough for you. Let's talk about another uh, area that is having a Janus moment. And that's guns and firearms. The Pew Research once again showed a Janus moment very recently in December of 2014. The majority of people said that they favored protecting the right of Americans to own guns over gun control ownership. And if you look at the trend here, that's a a lot of back and forth since 2009 over where people feel and where people think about this. Regardless of where you sit on this issue, 11 million concealed carry permits have been issued since 2007. It's a 146% increase. There's over 20 million annual background checks done. That's about double the number that were done in 2006. This is a reality. This is true. Many people in Many parts of this country exercise their constitutional rights to carry firearms. So chances are at your show, local crew, local labor, somebody may well be doing that. I'm not advocating one direction or another. I'm saying, have you thought about it? Do you have a plan for it? Some of the folks here are in that industry. I've had good conversations with them about what is the right thing the way to do, you know, what is it, the right thing for your events? There are no single answers in this. But the Janus moment has taken place and a large number of people are exercising these rights. So the question I would have for you and we don't have the survey is, do you ha have you thought about this? Have you talked with your own teams? Do you have a um, point of view and or a plan on the fact that this is a reality and this is happening? Do you want to ask how many of them have a, 
<coughs> in, in any of your official on-site event show policies, security policies, whatever they're called, right. by a yeah. show, of, go ahead, finish yeah, up. So, so um, you know, have any, who has either a policy in their attendee rec guides or registration guides or anything else, who has a policy? So I see two, maybe three, four hands. Who's even aware of the laws relating to concealed firearms and firearms in the states that they're doing shows in? About the same, maybe a few other hands. So again, I mean, we're really clear. I'm not advocating one direction or another. This is not about advocating. This is not about politicizing. This is about being aware of what's happening culturally, what's happening technically and socially. And, and just to take this one step further, not to be absurd about this, but read this yesterday. Animal rights. After many, many years of no movement in the data, there has been a 50% increase in the percentage of people who feel that animals should have the same rights as people. Same rights of protection, same rights of, not, of free of harm and free of exploitation. And I just read this yesterday. There is a court that is hearing a case where a writ of habeas corpus, basically a demand to prove why two chimpanzees at a university were being jailed, was put together and a court is now hearing the case of whether these chimpanzees are being held illegally. Rather than the question of are they property of the university, the question has already risen to what rights do these animals have to being treated more like humans than not like humans. Again, this may seem absurd, this may seem extreme, but at what point will spanking your puppy who's just soiled the carpet be the same as spanking your child and punishable by similar laws? So this is just something I found fascinating and more and more it's starting to uh, come into the conversation. Now, this will sound editorial and it is editorial. This is a first world problem by an awful lot of standards. Um, but this is absolutely a problem to think about, or sorry, a, a trend to watch. And will these numbers get closer together? Who knows? We may or may not see it. By the way, the top line is not don't need protection. The top line is some protection. 94% of people feel that animals should have some protection or the same rights as people. And we're not talking about just pets. We're talking about animals, all types. At what point do zoos completely disappear because it's illegally uh, imprisoning animals purely for pleasure. So 15 or 20 or 25 years from now, you may have to explain to your children, your grandchildren, what zoos used to be because they don't exist. Uh, a friend of mine shared recently, they're watching Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Everybody rem remember with that movie? Yeah. And these kids at one point, there's a, in, in the plot line, the cassette answering machine is pretty important to the plot line because Ferris uses the answering machine to make sounds and to respond when people knock on the door to his room. The kids watching this, who were in their teens, had no idea what an answering machine was. Dad, what's that? What's that device? So it is not inconceivable that history will, that the change will move forward and people will forget history. Um, so we have the, the results. So we have the results of the first survey question. Move on to the next, sorry. <laughs> we don't. Um, so one, one other area that's, that's, I think, important, and we're seeing a lot of trends, is, is in economics. Who here, by show of hands, is actually more than pleased with the revenue you're getting from your events? You don't know what to do with the extra cash. You're not looking for more sponsors. Yeah, OK. The base of economics is supply and demand. If you can increase the demand against your supply, you can charge more. If you can limit the supply against the demand you have, you can charge more. Um, and yet, in many cases, there are some simple opportunities for us to apply economic theory into what we're doing. Um, the first is the early bird discount. Who, has, who does early bird pricing? Yeah. We're starting to get rid of early bird pricing. Why? Early bird pricing has no limitation to supply. It's time-based. And because it has no limitation to supply, there is really not much of an incentive to buy soon or buy early. The incentive is buy before that magic moment. So we all see that spike when early bird ends. But it's also really unpredictable. 
we'll go in and say, hey, we think we're going to get X number of early bird purchases, and we'll exceed that number, and that's actually bad for us because it means less revenue for more people than we would have otherwise. So what we're doing is we're moving from early bird ends on a certain day to early bird as a capacity. There's 5,000 early bird tickets. There's 3,000 early bird tickets, whatever the number is. And so now the information is not you have until May 31st. The information is there's 20 left. When they run out, they run out. Much more predictable. We know exactly how many early bird tickets we're going to sell and much more urgency created in the system for people to buy them. And as soon as the early bird runs out, okay, regular price tickets kick in. And we've actually talked a bit about having late bird tickets. <laughs> you know, when we've sort of hit our capacity for the event and we say any more people on site is going to really increase our cost by X, we'll need to expand this, we'll need to add to that. We've actually are looking at do we have a year late fee? We're unlikely to do that. But I'd encourage you to take a look at the pure supply and demand. It'll allow you to get away from early bird pricing extensions, which to me are sort of the worst thing we can possibly do. Hey, we got this early bird. It ends on the 31st. And no, it doesn't really end on the 31st. Now it ends on, you know, June 15th. Because we either didn't get as many as we wanted or it didn't drive the traffic. So consider looking at a change in the supply and demand model for your early birds. Another thing that has been having huge success is ancillary fees. How many of you flew here? Did you pay an ancillary fee? Check a bag, upgrade your seat length, anything? Yeah. Um, right now, 14% of the airline's revenue comes from ancillary fees. And you can see the little red track at the bottom. In 2006, zero. And the airline businesses were in trouble. In 2007, they started introducing ancillary fees. The ancillary fees don't have to be punitive. They don't have to be as unhappy creating experiences as I'm checking my bag now, it costs me $25, or I'd like a few extra inches of leg room, I have to spend another 60 bucks, what have you. Cirque du Soleil, anyone been to Cirque recently? Yeah, Cirque du Soleil has the red tent. It's a VIP experience that you can do before the event. For a few extra dollars, you can get into a special entrance. There's some food and beverage. It's a smaller space, and you can uh, bring your guests there. You can have an experience before the experience, and then you go from the red tent into the main experience. That's an ancillary fee. That's a plus pass, if you will. Uh, more and more concert promoters and concert tours. KISS has a VIP tour package. Justin Tim Live Nation um, for Justin Timberlake alone had six different packages you could choose from. The autographed package where you got a bunch of swag that was signed, the early entry package. How many people would prefer the experience of being able to enter the venue earlier than the rush, earlier than the crowd? Yeah. So more and more concert promoters and airlines and other places where experiences take place are looking at how they can recognize the realities of supply and demand and monetize them. We have what we call up passes, plus passes. Right now, or sorry, in the past, our attendees chose the hotels on their own. And some of the hotels were more convenient for different reasons to different attendees. Some wanted to be near the venue. Some wanted to be closer to downtown. Some wanted to have their whole group together. So we started looking at the realities that the number of hotel rooms adjacent to the convention center was actually a fixed inventory. It was our supply. And rather than just leaving it to the groups to just pick what they wanted to pick, we said, you know what? Access to that hotel is part of a plus pass. And we charged extra to be able to get a room at that hotel. This may sound terrible. We sold out in an hour. We raised extra revenue. We did a plus pass recently with the Hard Rock Hotel in Chicago where not only could you stay at the Hard Rock Hotel, but you got membership into the foundation room and membership to Lucky Strikes Bowling, which was attached for the run of the event. It was 500 extra dollars. We sold 200, we only had 200. We sold out well in advance of the event. So there are ways to create up packages, plus passes, things of that sort. Um, I have a question for you. We'll do this maybe more by show of hands at this point, but um, if we can put the question up on the screen. How much additional revenue do you think you could get 
from ancillary fees, from plus passes, from VIP experiences, et cetera. How many think you, you, none, you're already doing some kind of plus pass or some kind of VIP program? No hands. None, you don't think you'd ever go there. So feel free to use the uh, remotes as well, the clickers as well. We'll see if the system registers that. But um, you know, how much additional revenue do you think you can get from your attendees via these plus passes or ancillary fees? Zero, we're already doing this. Zero, they'd never go for it. One to 3%, more than 3%. And as you're doing that, as you're voting, what I'll tell you is that we have done this for several of our events. And not only have we found that this is a great revenue stream, and let's be clear, Microsoft's not, Microsoft is not in the events business. I don't look for revenue from these shows because it goes to my bottom line. We use events to drive our business. We do have costs that we have to offset when we put the events on, and that's one of the reasons that we do these up passes and plus passes. But we do it as much to allow people choice of the experiences they're going to have. So our plus pack pass came with access to a private lounge that you could bring a guest into, maybe do some meetings. It gave you reserved seating in the front of the keynote. It gave you uh, a short line to check into. In fact, the hotels that were plus pass hotels had check-in and registration right there in the lobby. You didn't even have to go to the main center to pick up your badges. It was those kinds of things that we could offer on a convenience basis. We took nothing away from everyone else. This is not about lesser for some, it's about more for those who want to put that experience. With Cirque, it's not that you got less of a, of a Cirque performance, it's you got the chance to go into the red tent beforehand. So think of it not as what do we take away from some, think of it as what do we add. So we do pre and post surveys in all of our events. And what we found was that statistically those who were buying the Plus Pass were our greatest advocates pre-event and had the greatest positive progression post-event. So not only were they saying and voting with their dollars, yes, I want this experience, I want that convenience, I want that uh, unique experience that other people may not want, et cetera, but they happen to already be our greatest fans. And chances are that within your audience, you have segments who you can also provide these unique experiences with. For most of your attendees, the price of admission to your event is a small part of their investment in coming to your show. They have travel, they have housing, they have uh, food and beverage, they have other expenses on top of that. So an ancillary experience is not a make or break thing. A lot of folks when we started these programs said you'll never get anyone to buy this. We had almost, we had close to 1,000 out of 23,000 people at our last event who bought one package or another of this. And I know some shows do VIP programs where you literally can have the front row of every breakout is for VIP attendees only. You don't have to have signed up for it. You don't have to show up early. Front row VIP only. And I've seen prices in the thousands for these kinds of packages. And I'll bet you, almost guarantee you, that among your audience you have some segment willing to make that kind of investment and commitment. So another trend that we're seeing is code of conduct. And this is one I find really interesting. Um, and I wrote about this very recently in Janus Dialogues. There's at times a association of a change in behavior when attending events. Nothing against Vegas, who I know is here and a sponsor, and we appreciate that very much. But even Vegas is what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas, is a bit of a truism and homage to the fact that when you go to an event, you don't always act the same way you would at your grandparents' dining room table. So what's been happening recently is that events are starting to create codes of conduct. Some of these sound very social statements, political in nature. I saw one that actually starts with, why do we have a code of conduct? Because unfortunately we need one. Others are very to the point. Some look like they're written by legal. Some look like they're written by PR. Some look like they're written by social PhDs. But at the end of the day, the question of if reminding people how to behave and making them understand that there's a consequence to unacceptable behavior will make one person act better, then there's really not a much of a downside in publishing. This. So we'll do this one very quickly. How many of you have a code of conduct for your events? One, two, three, four, maybe four, maybe a dozen or so here. Um, how many of you would consider it? Yeah, a few more. And I'd be curious, and we can uh, either in the Q&A later or whatever, as to why you wouldn't. But this is something we're seeing more and more. It's making the attendees 
especially those who at times may have been disenfranchised by the event itself for any reason, feel a little bit more empowered, a little bit more comfortable coming into the facility. So let's change into technology just a little bit. We talked about user-generated content. There's new technology that's taking user-generated content to a whole nother level. Much of user-generated content for the last decade or so has been text. It's been the written word. It's been photographs. Um, maybe it's had some video embedded in it. Certainly YouTube and other services like that have made this distribution of video very easy. But it hasn't quite gotten to the point of real-time broadcast. How many of you are familiar with Meerkat or Periscope? Yeah. How many of you have seen it used at your events yet? Yeah, a few. Um, Meerkat and Periscope and now Skype. Skype has a new uh, service that allows, called Skype Broadcast, that allows you to stream real-time video up to 10,000 followers on Skype. These are technologies that allow you, with a mobile phone, to stream in real-time video. So anyone here could be streaming my presentation to your followers in real time. That is a level of user-generated content or user-generated distribution, if you will, or broadcast that's until this point been somewhat unseen. How many of you would be comfortable knowing that all the content from your sessions and your keynotes were being broadcast out not through your channels but through your audience's channels? One, two, a lot fewer hands than there were who were aware of Meerkat and Periscope. Um, some folks are taking big advantage of this. Madonna's been releasing video debuts over Meerkat. She got some pushback because Meerkat had already become not cool and Periscope was now cool. And her fans were telling her that she was falling behind because she was on Meerkat and not Periscope. Major League Baseball just clarified after some confusion that they were more than fine with audience members at the stadiums meerkatting and broadcasting through their phones their baseball games. Think again about the possibility of your audience members saying, you know what, we're going to get together in a little consortium. We're not going to send 50 people from our department. We're going to send five people from our department. And they're going to broadcast every session back and we're going to watch it at home or at our offices. What would that mean? And, and the, the advantage that this has over just recording it and sharing it, which people could have done before, is that now you're seeing it in real time. So if you have a question for that presenter, you don't have to be in the room any longer. We've lost the value proposition of come to the event, inter interconnect with the speakers, hear what they have to say, and talk with them. Well, now the people who are not in the room can simply social media to the person who is, and they represent that broader group. This isn't a question of when, this is a question of it is already happening. To what degree will it impact your events? And then one other uh, new technology, and this is admittedly a little bit of a sales pitch, but it fits in with the conversation. Um, how many of you speak multiple languages? Yeah. Um, how many of you are familiar with Skype Translator? One or two hands back there. So one of the things that Skype is doing is allowing for translation not just of text, but of the spoken word in real time. How many of you hire real-time translators for your keynotes into other languages? Yeah. So let's take a look at the video. The problem of having a machine understand human speech has been around in research for a very long time. But now at Microsoft, we are on the verge of having a tool available to all that allows us to speak universally with anyone on the planet. For over a decade, we tried to develop the means for improving speech recognition using Gaussian mixture models. All of that changed when our researchers got together and decided to take a new look at the use of deep neural nets applied to speech recognition, now the new gold standard in speech. Research is a long game by getting smarter every day and sticking with an understanding of the value of basic research, we eventually get to a point where wonderful things can happen. Imagine being able to speak in German and have your message conveyed grammatically and semantically correct in English. That future is here. With a Skype translator, it all starts just as with any other Skype call. You just call someone. 
But now the difference is, the person you're calling doesn't have to speak your language. But I wanted to talk to you about the email that I sent you yesterday. Do you need any changes? There was one thing though. Could you change the green to a lighter shade? Könnten Sie das Grün durch einen helleren Farbton ändern? Ja, wir können das Grün viel heller machen. Yes, we can make the green much brighter. Ich sende dir heute Abend eine neue Datei. I'm sending you a new file tonight. That sounds great. I look forward to it. Das klingt toll. With a Skype translator, it's a full human-to-human -human interaction that crosses the language barrier. It's truly a magical experience. Does anyone see value for this? Yeah. Um, I got hands and laughter, I guess that's good. Um, <clears throat> this is, and again, my apologies for sort of the in-your-face sales moment, but uh, this to me is a new norm. This changes so much. In five or ten years, the question will be not what is an answering cassette tape, but what is a real-time translator. Skype is a mobile device application already. This is not something you do just on a laptop or a powerful PC. The video you saw is not mocked up. It is how it runs. You can go to Skype Translator Beta and download this right now and start to play with it. Uh, we're supporting three or four languages now. Ultimately, the plan's over 100 languages in real time. What does this do to the audiences that you can address? What does this do to the business you can conduct? I, I, this is, and, and who's familiar with the Babel Fish from Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe? I just aged myself tremendously. Thank, thank you to the rest of the geeks in the room. Uh, the babble fish was literally a little fish you put in your ear that could speak any language and translate for you. Um, from the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, which was, at least for me growing up, the nerd's Bible. Um, and this is that technology realized. So uh, that is uh, just one of the latest emerging fringe technologies that is making its way towards becoming a new norm and the ability to speak your language to anyone else on the planet and have the technology translate for you in real time in both directions will be the norm in a few years. So with that, I hope that this 40 plus minutes was valuable for at least a minute or so for each of you. Uh, and I think we'll be opening up to some questions. I thank you for your time.